Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. It's Monday, January 30th. I'm Shauna Smith along with Dave Briggs. Let's get you up to speed on this afternoon's market action. You can see the rally that we've seen for most of the month taking a bit of a pause as we really gear up for what is going to be a very busy week for the markets. 20% of the S&P reporting earnings. We've got the Fed decision on Wednesday, jobs report on Friday, just to name a few of the huge headlines that investors will obviously closely be watching here over the next couple of trading days. We're looking at the Dow right around the lows of the session off just about 200 points. S&P off just about 1%. The Nasdaq Composite, the biggest laggard here of the three, off just over 1.5%. Some pressure in some of those larger cap tech names as we get ready to see results from a lot of the larger players within that industry. Taking a look at crude, crude also settling at this lowest level that we've seen in just about two and a half weeks. You can see it below 78 bucks a barrel. I mentioned that Fed decision on Wednesday, also the OPEC meeting. Clearly some concerns about demand and and supply, what that means for crude here going forward, looking at crude off just about two and a half percent. The sector action mostly red here on your screen. As you can see, consumer staples, the only sector barely holding on to gains in intraday trading. You're looking at the energy sector off just over two percent. Technology, one of the worst performers there. And taking a look at some of those larger cap tech names, Dave, under pressure here, Microsoft, Google off just over two percent. Looking at Amazon and Apple here off just over about one, one and a half percent as well. Not clear how much to take stock in today. It's kind of the, the pregame, the warm up act. We've yeah. got jobs, we've got on the Fed. I don't know how everything's going to go. Yeah, it's a big week. I yeah. think this is just, just barely tipping the iceberg because we got a huge week on tap. I mentioned the Fed, I mentioned jobs. We've also got some big tech earnings on tap this week Meta, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, just to name a few. All up between 9 and 16% this year, all reporting earnings this week. Overall, analysts are bullish on the tech sector despite recent headwinds. And Amazon has the highest percentage of buy ratings on the street. Let's just start with a little Amazon talk. Um, basically, nothing is out of their reach right now. It's still an AWS story, but they're into healthcare now. Streaming gets the most headlines, probably the slowest part of the story. Stock up. Uh, down 32% in the last year, up 16%. A lot of upside ahead. Not clear what to make of this week's earnings report. It's not clear what to make of this week's earnings reports, especially what we after what we saw last week from Microsoft. One of the big worrisome headlines in that report from Microsoft was slowing growth going looking ahead for its Azure business. So that placed a lot of questions just in terms of what we could hear from Amazon for AWS. We know that's so important there to their business. So any guidance there, I think, is really going to be key. But it's interesting when you take a look at those analyst ratings with Amazon, the largest percentage of buy ratings here on the street when it comes to some of those bigger tech name plays. Clearly, a huge focus will be on Amazon. Dave, I'm also closely watching Meta because we talked about the fact that Meta, clearly one of the worst performers of the year looking back to 2022, it's hard to really see that changing when you take a look at the fundamentals, at least, of their business outside just a pure valuation play at this point. Clearly a tough road ahead, losses in the Reality Labs uh, segment. That, of course, could actually exceed what they predicted, exceed that $4 billion number. So that, of course, will be a focal point here in this report and layoffs. We know layoffs is something we've heard from many of these companies, except for Apple. So we'll see whether or not that changes. No way. You think it'll change? I don't think no so. No way. Not Tim, right Tim now. Cook's not going to do it. I don't think we can count it out. Only increased headcount about 20% from pre-pandemic. So I, I guess I'm not uh, ready for Tim Cook to declare uh, layoffs are here. Yeah, Meta is the one that I, I still don't think they're through the woods yet. But you look back to November, the stock's up more than 60% since November 3rd. So uh, investors feel otherwise. They're not through the metaverse mess, right? They've still got some cost cutting, still probably some more layoffs. Uh, Amazon, we showed that chart, 93% are bullish on it. How about Alphabet real quickly? 92% of analysts are bullish on the case for uh, Google parent Alphabet. And when it comes to them, two threats for me. AI, which obviously the chat GPT threat, some have now suggested this is a major threat to search. We're not going to see that on the earnings report. We probably won't hear about that in the call. But the threat of AI and the threat of anti-tech, uh, anti-trust regulation from the government, those are the two things weighing on on Alphabet. Yeah, certainly a massive challenges here for that tech giant ahead of these results. I think we might get a question or two from analysts about those things because 
clearly when you look at the forward looking picture here with Google, with Alphabet, a lot of those question marks about the second half of 2023 into 2024 really uh, weighs heavily on those two huge issues, Dave, that you just brought up. All right, well, as earnings season heats up this week, a slew of high-profile companies have a proven track record of performing better than others. Jared Blickery is here with a closer look. And Jared, who's expected to top expectations this time around? Well, not surprisingly, Apple is looking the best on my list here, but I just wanted to go over the performance of some of these mega caps. Now, this is a negative, uh, the NASDAQ 100 year to date. So uh, some high flyers here, especially in terms of the big names. We we got Amazon up 20%. We got uh, Meta up 23%. Tesla up almost 40%. NVIDIA up 32%. And uh, this comes after a terrible year. Let's not forget that Meta had two quarters last year where they missed something by like 20 Well, why the price reaction was something like 20% down the next day. So what I've done is I've looked at three stocks that are reporting this week. We got Apple, Meta, and Amazon. And uh, Apple, you can see, usually beats its number 91% of the time. Now, you think that'd be great and everything, but the one day price per, uh, percent change, that is going to 52%, so barely better than half. And this goes back 10 years. And the results are real for all three of these. The results are all three skewed a little bit to the downside by what's happened over the last year. Now, sticking with Apple, the median EPS price is 4.1%. Uh, so that's in terms of the earnings per share amount beat. And then the median one day price change, 2.1%. Uh, that is only uh, only the, for Apple, I got to say, that is actually pretty low. Throughout history, it has been higher at times. And then you do the same analysis for Meta and Amazon. Now, Meta, EPS beat 86%, notwithstanding what I was talking about, those misses over the last year. One day per uh, percent price change, 52%. Uh, you, these numbers really don't square going down the mark. So I think what I want to say here is day traders, great. If you have this, uh, if you have the opportunity uh, to get involved in one of these trades after the bell, before the bell the next day, into the close, great. But this doesn't necessarily have predictive power about the stock, and that just has to do with the environment that we're in. One of the stats that I like to look at is options implied one day price change. And that's done, uh, that's signaled by the options market. So for instance, for Apple, we're looking at an options market that is uh, pricing in a 4% price change after the fact. And what happens historically, usually only about half of that, 2.1%. Meta, we're looking at an 8% change. Amazon, looking at a 9% change. So my other conclusion is this is probably going to be a volatile week, and we're probably going to see some bigger reactions, even in these big names, than we would ordinarily. All right, Jared, good stuff. Thank you, my friend. Busy week ahead with big tech earnings on deck, housing data, and the Fed on Wednesday, Jobs Friday. Joining us now to tell us how investors should play the market on a week like this is Liz Young, SoFi Head of Investment Strategy. Liz, nice to see you. As always, those tech earnings, what do you expect we'll learn this week? Yeah, they're, they're looming large, right? And we've kind of come into this, I think, expecting that tech is not holding up the best. We've seen plenty of headlines about cost cutting, about layoffs. So I don't think that the market is hoping for outlandish beats on these earnings. The other thing that I would say, too, is that although these are the companies that we've been used to kind of pulling us out of the mud for the last couple years, they got hit pretty hard last year. I don't think that big tech is going to be what pulls us out from this period. So I think earnings are definitely important as far as sentiment goes this week. I don't think that investors should expect anything outrageous from a beats perspective and actually from the whole market on that front because we've got fewer companies than average beating on earnings and those are beating on earnings that are already lowered. So we're not in a great setup for earnings. This is still expected to be the first negative quarter since 2020. So Liz, and how's that set us up for the rest of the year given the fact that earnings have been weak like you're saying so far into the quarter, you're not expecting things to really shift for the remainder of the earnings season. What does that mean for broader markets here over the next couple of quarters? Yeah, so usually there's a formula. The market breaks first, and obviously we had a pretty bad 2022. I wouldn't rule out another big drawdown in 2023 as some of this gets digested. But then usually earnings go. So if this is, in fact, the first negative earnings growth quarter, if we have two of those in a row, that would be an earnings recession. I don't think that that is entirely priced in 
to the market yet. So if we do have worse earnings than expected, or we've got, it looks like, two quarters of negative earnings growth in a row, I think the market does need to come down from where it is right now. I mean, we're trading close to 18 times forward earnings on the S&P. That's really high, and it's been a pretty big risk rally in January. It's almost as if we unpriced uh, an earnings recession. So I think there would be a little bit of digestion, which probably causes some downside as we see those numbers come out. That MLIV Pulse survey shows 70% of 383 respondents say the S&P has not hit its low. Do you think we'll retest some lows later this, uh, later this year? Look, I'm not going to call levels on the S&P, but what I will say is, again, I think that valuations are a bit high here. And also remember, yes, this has been a strong rally in January, but it comes after a pretty painful December. So the NASDAQ was already down 9% in December up only, you know, it's 11% up in January, but that's just partially even making up for what happened in December. Now, as the market digests whether or not we actually have a classic recession and whether or not earnings are worse than expected and operating margins are getting compressed, that's where I think you see another flush down. The level that I would be watching is in that 3,500 mark. Now, that is close to the October lows, but that's where I would want to start nibbling, and that's where I would get actually bullish on some of the more cyclical mm -hmm. parts of the market. There's lots of focus is going to be on Jerome Powell on Wednesday afternoon. Big anticipation of just a 25% basis point hike this time around. What are you looking to hear? What are you hoping to hear from the Fed chair on Wednesday? Well, one thing I would point out to investors is that I do think the hiking cycle is maturing, meaning they're closer to the end of hikes than they are to the beginning, obviously. But as that hiking cycle matures, it means that it just starts the economic pain in the cycle because there is a lag. So it is good that we might have some clarity about what the Fed is going to do as they get each hike behind them. We're expecting 25 this week, maybe another 25 in March, and then that's it, where they get to a top rate of 5%. But it doesn't change the fact that the economic data and everything that's going on activity-wise still needs to digest all of the tightening that's occurred for the last nine to 10 months. So there's still a lot to be said. I do think that Jerome Powell will start to shift his narrative from inflation to jobs. Because once we look at the labor market, that's the piece that has become sticky. Wage growth is sticky. Services inflation is sticky. In order for that to come down and not get stuck at too high of a level, we do need the labor market. And what I think he wants to see is that the labor market comes a little bit more back into balance. But will we see that at the end of the week? The layoffs so far have been mainly isolated to the tech sector, with the exception of maybe Hasbro and 3M and maybe a handful of others. Will we see anything that resembles pain in the jobs number? I don't think we're going to see anything that sends off alarm bells yet. I think that it's still a little bit too early for that. To your point, most of the layoffs that have occurred were in tech. That makes up a pretty small percentage of the labor market. And we're not entirely sure that all of those people are actually filing for unemployment benefits. So you may not see that come through entirely. I do, however, think that some of those announcements from big industrial companies could be the canary in the coal mine. So you want to be mindful of that and make sure that you're watching as it may bleed into other sectors. It certainly did bleed into financials already. So it's not anymore just isolated to tech. It's in tech and financials. And then we want to watch that industrials piece. If it starts to hit kind of the machinery part of the country, uh, the, the what I would call the rust belt and those companies. All right, Liz Young, great stuff. So far, head of investment strategy, thank you. Well, we are just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, Ford following Tesla's lead and slashing prices on its Mustang Mach-E. We look at the impact on the broader sector as a battle over EV dominance takes yet another turn. We discuss next. And Ford following in Tesla's...
Ford following in Tesla's tire tracks, if you will, this week, cutting prices of its electric crossover Mustang Mach-E by as much as $5,900 per vehicle. Senior Autos reporter Proz remain in here with more on the price drop. Proz, it seems like nobody had a choice in the matter after Elon made that move. I mean, this is all, this is all in response to Tesla, right? They, they dropped the, they kind of dro dropped the gauntlet? Dropped the... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think Some so. Some sort of a gauntlet was dropped, right? So, yeah, I mean, they I cut... I think you drop a gauntlet, actually, but, but proceed. <laughs> <laughs> I think you run the gauntlet. Run the gauntlet, drop the you, something. You drop a hammer. Drop the hammer, <laughs> yes. Yes, the axe. Cut, cut those prices. Uh, we are off the tracks. Get back on them. I'll try. So uh, by, by as little as 600 to, like you said, almost $6,000 across the range of Mustang mach -E's there, you know, trying to compete with Tesla. Also, one of the most popular models there, the e-performance all-wheel drive, I think, of the Mach-E, below that $55,000 price cap, very important for those EV tax credits. So big deal for Ford. You know, Ford said, quote, we're not going to cede ground to anyone. So some strong words there. That's basically alluding, alluding to Tesla. They also said they're going to increase production. They didn't say by how much they are going to do this year, but they sold around 40,000 Mustang Mach-E's in 2022. So I imagine you'll see a decent lift from that. Yeah, certainly a number of these automakers feeling the pressure here following these price cuts. Press, it's interesting when you take a look at Wall Street's reaction because at first there was so much worry about what this was going to do with margins. Now it seems like that sentiment has shifted a little bit. More and more are getting optimistic. There was a new upgrade today on the stock, a little bit more positive outlook here going forward for Tesla. Yeah, Berenberg upgraded Tesla from uh, a hold to buy here, talking about how these these, the concerns over price cuts were misguided. They talk about how, you know what, in the short term, yes, it might affect margins, but in the long term, as factories like, like Berlin, sorry, Austin, Berlin, and also, you know, Shanghai, also they build more, they can build at a cheaper level, and that's gonna offset some of those price cut concerns, margin concerns, so uh, the analysts are upgraded stock. They also um, downgraded a GM and also BMW here, talking about weaker demand supply chain and also price mix concerns. Although they said that luxury cars can kind of weather a bit more high, charge a bit more for, for luxury cars that won't actually affect the sales too much. Just be curious, so Ford doesn't have the margins that Tesla does. So when they make that $5,900 price cut, that's far more significant for them than it may be Tesla. All right, sticking with electrification, you saw a new class of race cars at Daytona this weekend. What do we know about yeah. this? Yeah, you know, you know, Dave, at, at Daytona, the 24-hour race, a big deal there. A new uh, era of hyper cars there, racing cars here. These cars are actually hybrid powers, power, hybrid powered cars, Acura, Cadillac, BMW, and Porsche all competing in this new class. Super fast cars, really kind of high tech, kind of hear them in the pit lane, they actually go in all electric quietly, then they fire up the engine, they get going. So anyway, you know, I talked to Cadillac's head of global head, Rory Harvey, about this, about these cars, about how that hybrid tech trickles down into road cars, but also kind of like, what's the reaction been to the brand actually kind of going, pushing forward full EVs? And he spoke to dealers and also customers about that, and here's what he had to say. Dependent upon where dealers sit, as an example, some areas uh, EV adoption is uh, much more progressive than others. Um, there's no doubt that EV adoption is happening. Uh, I guess it's a question as to how quick and uh, and where. Um, but our dealers are really excited. You know, we had them all together in San Francisco last year. We showed them our product portfolio through to 2025. Uh, most of the feedback that we got from that from our dealer partners was exceptional. As an example, we measured their responses and on the product portfolio going forward, on a rating out of six, they gave us 5.9. So uh, they're super pumped up, super excited. Um, you know, if you looked at last year, we really did have a solid year. So, you know, if you exclude Tesla and you look at the traditional luxury brands, Cadillac was the fastest growing traditional luxury brand here in the US with 13.9% growth year on year. Uh, it was a challenging year the year before, but it was a challenging year for the industry and for all of our competitors. So uh, we were super pleased with the foundations that we were able to build there. So 14% growth year over year there for Cadillac. Uh, Rory also did tell me that we have a new car coming out, a new EV coming out in the first half of this year and another one in the back half of the year. So two big kind of announcements coming up for them. Are they gonna get on an F1 team though? That's the big question in my world. Then with Andretti Autosport, they really want in. They have the financial backing. Guggenheim, I think, covering the 200 million. You think they get in? Yeah, I mean, I asked them about that and they said that that entrance is, is sort of like, it's up to the FIA, right? And yeah. they don't want to admit them. But he said that we are very excited about that. 
It's a global, Cadillac's a global brand. They sell huge in China, actually pretty big in Europe too. So they really want to get on that stage with Andretti Auto, Autosport, uh, get that F1 entry. I mean, this is a big deal for, for the company. And you're going to hear a lot more about that, a big brand yeah. going to F1. Maybe a great move for the sport, yeah. help with American interest, just my POV. Pros, thank you, good stuff. All right, Ford, uh, we talked about them earlier. Ford will report earnings on Thursday and share as well. A bit of a rough day today. Um, up more than 10%, though, this year. You see the fall today. The automaker plans to make your life easier, though, when it comes to repairs. Most Ford dealers will actually participate in a program that promises to pick your car up for service, drop it off when it's repaired. If, however, it's routine maintenance, like an oil change, Mobile technicians can do the work right there at your house. Ford will pay dealers to participate in the program. So basically, if you're one of those people that likes your dry cleaning picked up and dropped off on hangers with starch, this new service is for you, Sean. Does that sound like something that appears? Certainly appeals? for me. I think it's a huge oh. deal. It's really difficult. You got to go get a deal. You got to have someone pick you up. You got to have someone drop you off. Seems like a big win for the customer. It's a massive win for the customer, and it really just speaks to the competitive landscape right out there, out yeah. there right now for automakers. They need to be creative. They need to come up with uh, certain segments, certain offerings that are tailored directly to their consumer. I think this is very, very smart. Of Guessing GM is going to have to match that in the year ahead. Coming up, delivering profits. Wall Street gets bullish on the gig economy. One analyst explains why now might be the time to buy both Uber and DoorDash after the break. Big stocks seem to be back in favor. Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, all a big since the start of the year. And after a decade of growth at all costs, one analyst making the call that, quote, the bumpiest parts of the ride are in the rear view mirror. And now's the time to buy DoorDash and Uber. Joining us now is the analyst behind that call. We want to bring in Michael Morton, SVB Moffat Nathanson, senior research analyst. Michael, it's great to see you here. So it certainly seems like you think that the focus has now shifted from growth at all costs, something we've talked about time and time again when it comes to these companies, to profitability. What makes you so convinced, so confident 
that that shift has in fact happened and will stick. Yes, uh, thank you for having me on. So there's a couple factors behind it. Uh, these are enormous addressable markets, some of the, good, the biggest spend pie you, you could really find in technology investing. And these companies grew at breakneck pace for a decade. I mean, Uber, 2009 founding to over 100 billion in bookings. The food delivery industry alone from pre-COVID to today added 60 billion in bookings. This was a pace where you're growing as fast as you possibly can and hiring people as fast as humanly possible. And at some point when you, the growth rate starts to decelerate, you see an increased focus on profitability. The market was rewarding companies like this for a really long time, especially the private markets, to so just grow, don't worry about profits. Uh, and we think, based off of the language coming from the companies, if you look at uh, DoorDash's CEO letter to employees uh, in November, tweets from the CTO and co-founder, or also the CEO of Uber, Dara, wrote a letter about a focus on free cash flow. If you read the proxy report, um, his incentive compensation is heavily weighted towards adjusted EBITDA growth. So we think these Companies are maturing not to where like, they don't have growth in their future, but maturing beyond the growth at all costs and to now uh, showing profitability growth for shareholders. What about the potential backdrop of a recession? Some have come on this program and suggested that actually the price of cars is going to be a catalyst for companies like Uber and Lyft, but it seems uh, it seems counterintuitive. Uh, it seems like a recession would be very harmful for both of these companies. Yes, yeah, so there's two sides of this question. Yeah. Um, and one is the driver supply side, where we, as it's no secret to everybody on the show that uh, record un low unemployment rates, uh, all of the big retailers have increased their minimum wages dramatically over the last several years. It's simply harder for Uber and Lyft to convince people to be drivers. And DoorDash has done slightly better to the fact that it's less intimidating to pick up a bag of food than allow a stranger to get in your car. And you see the demographic shift, shift as well, where DoorDash has basically half female drivers. So it's been an overhang on these companies for the last several years as you have record low unemployment. Now, as that could reverse in a weak macro environment and people are looking for kind of the incremental uh, money on the weekend or a Thursday night to kind of help fill in for their budgetary constraints, it's good for the driver supply side. Now, the other side of that equation and the question around macro pressure for these companies is going to be, well, what about the consumer? Like, it's no secret that it's more expensive to take an Uber across town from East Village to the West Village versus a $3 L train. Or what about picking up food versus having it delivered? If you're talking about McDonald's, our report uh, shows a 80% price increase between picking it up in real life or ordering it from Uber or DoorDash. Now, we tried to look at historical examples. Now, these companies didn't exist in prior macro downturns, right? They weren't even yeah. conceived yet. And we looked at how consumers behaved for taxis and how consumers behaved in restaurant spend. And both were incredibly resilient in weak macro environments. Uh, taxi cab spending in 2008, 2009 only declined for three quarters, low single digits. Restaurant spend is incredibly resilient in the O oh, one recession, it grew through the recession in 2008, 2009, only three quarters of year over year declines, and it was one to 2%. And this kind of overlays on a long term consumer trend of spending more money on people preparing food for them. So that's a long answer, but the, the macro aspect weighs on both sides of these businesses. Well, Michael, what about Lyft? Because while you still are positive on Uber, you have a market perform rating on Lyft. The stock is actually off to a very, very strong start to the year. Why are you still on the sidelines? Yeah, so um, Uber did an incredible job of building a scaled network that creates a network effect on both the supply and the demand side. And there's some crossover around people delivering food and being Uber drivers for regular fares. Lyft is focused just on the U.S. And there are aspects of this business where you benefit from scale and network. If you look about the advertising and marketing dollars that you have to spend, it's just a percentage of your bookings. Uber and DoorDash get a greater benefit as they get larger and the advertising intensity declines. Now, as you have more people downloading an Uber app than a Lyft app, 
it's harder to recruit drivers. This goes back to that unemployment question and driver supply. Lyft has to keep spending money to convince drivers to work for Lyft and, and pick up fares, and it's a scale game. They're just in a, in a tough spot. Uh, we're market perform. We're, like, we're, we're not overly negative on it, but we're taking just a balanced approach towards Lyft. We, we, we want to see more proof uh, in the numbers before we can get too excited that they're able to get out of this tough predicament that they're in at the moment. All right, got to leave it there. Michael Morton, Moffitt Nathanson, good to see you. I'm always conflicted, Shauna. I don't have any. I don't have any preference. Uber, Lyft. I don't care. I, oh, I check either. both. I'm always surprised to see the different expectations for the two company. When I thought all of us just picked the best price at the moment. Oh, I always pick the best price at the yeah. moment. And you know what? Lyft normally Lyft has normally the wins. better prices. That's honestly what I usually end up I find going the with. Same. It's just yeah, strictly I find, on price. Yeah, find Lyft usually wins. Coming up, Johnson and Johnson shares are sliding after a U.S. court nixed its plan for fighting lawsuits over talc-based baby powder. We'll have the details for you after the break. Time for a triple play. Three stocks that we're watching in the final 30 minutes of trading. We have Johnson & Johnson, AMC, and Macy's. My pick today, Johnson & Johnson shares a sinking. We saw the fall right after noon today. Now that came after a federal appeals court dismissed the pharma giant's talc bankruptcy case, ruling that it can't use bankruptcy to resolve more than the 40,000 cancer lawsuits over its baby powder. Now Johnson & Johnson created and spun off a separate unit, LTL Management, in an effort to shield the company from this talc litigation. The ruling, though, means that Johnson & Johnson will most likely have to defend itself against the claims that tainted talc was in the baby powder that causes cancer here. Now, the settlement value of all cases could be around $5 billion. Ali, taking a look at the price drop today, the worst performer in the Dow, that $5 billion number there. That's what really has the street concerned at this point. Yeah, and this just feels like a bad look, right, for J&J. &J. This is already a very controversial legal tactic, limiting the liability, protecting those corporate assets. But the numbers don't lie. As you mentioned, more than 40,000 lawsuits here. And it's interesting because J&J &J seems to be sticking to this decision. A spokesperson told the Wall Street Journal that they would challenge the ruling, mm -hmm. which was unanimous, by the way, and that it only put the talc subsidi subsidiary into bankruptcy 
to resolve the litigation for all parties. So I'm curious to see how this plays out. I'm honestly surprised that this is something that could even happen, but we'll yeah. just have to wait and see there. And going from one trending ticker to the next, my triple play today is AMC Entertainment. The stock uh, plummeting down right now about 8.5%, despite a plan to eliminate its heavy debt load. AMC saying in a securities filing on Friday that it plans to hold a shareholder meeting on March 14th to vote on a revamp of its capital structure, which, if approved, would enable the company's ape unit to be converted into common stock. Now, some analysts like Eric Wald at B. Riley Securities believes this is a, quote, massive equity-raising opportunity. However, uh, the share reaction today is likely some short-term frustration on the part of investors since converting apes to common stock would dilute the value of existing shares. But from a long-term standpoint, this could be a great thing for AMC's balance sheet. And if you're a shareholder of Ape, you're certainly happy today because that stock is up around 15% at this point. Not if you are a shareholder of AMC. I mentioned mm -hmm. Eric Wold. He's coming to come up on the show in the 4 o'clock hour to explain the proposal, the short-term versus long-term gains. But let's talk about with him the actual fundamentals of this company beyond this reverse split. What is the upside of this company five years from now? How do they survive? So much debt laden. Are these theaters going to come back? I got a lot of questions beyond the stock move about what makes this company tick down the road. But my play is Macy shares popping a bit on a note from Goldman Sachs, calling the retail giant one of the best positioned retail stocks with notable upside despite what is expected to be a tough year for the broader sector. Analyst Brooke Roach initiated coverage of the stock as a buy. Her $28 price target implies an upside of more than 20% over where the stock closed Friday. Quote, we believe M is best positioned to navigate an uncertain but softer landing economic environment. Roach said on a note Monday to clients, uh, the company is entering 23 in a position of strength with high affinity among customers, improving brand momentum compared with peers. It just goes on and on, China. This is a real surprise for a company that I don't think there was a lot of faith in. You see the stock up uh, just slightly today. I'm up, up almost 17% this year. Uh, I didn't feel that positive momentum, but elsewhere, look, when Goldman Sachs has it, Clearly, investors are buying it. Yeah, investors are really listening to this call. I have some questions, though, especially after we heard Macy's come out warn about how challenging of a couple of quarters it could potentially be for the retailer. And we've heard that similar type of messaging from a number of CEOs, from a number of ex executives within the retail industry. So, yes, they're saying Macy's is best positioned. I have some questions, though, just in terms of that upside potential, at least over the next couple of quarters. If we do see a stronger than expected downturn here or deeper than expected, a downturn. That obviously would be a huge concern here for Macy's, for the sector at large. Goldman, though, reiterating its sell rating on Kohl's. Nordstrom shares were also lower. They were downgraded to neutral. So they're not bullish across the board. Macy's, though, I was a little bit surprised by this call. Yeah, it just felt like, okay, the retail sector, it's not doing well overall, but Macy's oh. out of the bunch. Best position due to those strong margins, best position due to some of those profitability tailwinds that they have relative to those competitors. But if you take a look at you know retail sales, that continues to tick higher. The consumer is pressured. You mentioned that warning from Macy's that the holiday mm -hmm. quarter will likely come in softer due to inflation. So it seems like Macy's is like the lesser of the evils there. Mm -hmm. But overall, it's a very tough environment for the sector. Certainly very tough. In a tough. shirt and a dirty, uh, dirty laundry. Dirty bin. Exactly. Oh, I like yeah. that. I like That's that better. Right. We could have summed the whole thing up. <laughs> with just that one line. All right, well, coming up next here, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is reportedly planning a trip to Taiwan, and China is not happy about it. We'll tell you about China's warning to the speaker on the other side of the break.
China out with a warning to the U.S. about Taiwan. Essentially, keep out. Reports last week revealing U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy may soon visit Taiwan. A Chinese government official is responding, saying, quote, we urge certain individuals in the U.S. to earnestly abide by the one China principle. That, according to Bloomberg. Former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi made the trip back in August. She is the first House Speaker in a quarter century to visit Taiwan, and the trip caused quite a stir. For more on the latest out of Washington, we turn to Isaac Boltanski, BTIG Director of Policy Research. Good to see you, sir. Kevin McCarthy, uh, does he listen? I think at this point that we should assume that this trip is happening no matter what. And in fact, I read the comments last night out of China as, as almost confirmatory in terms of what Kevin McCarthy is likely to do. It would be very difficult to imagine him and his office backing away from what they've been talking about doing since even before he got the speaker's gavel. So, Isaac, how do, you, how do you then think China is going to respond if he, in fact, does follow through on that trip? And there was a report out that the Air Force General, that an Air Force General in an internal memo saying that the U.S. and China were at risk of going to war in two years. How realistic do you think that threat is? So let me answer the first question first, which I, I think that we will see undoubtedly a response and something has to be done um, both uh, to appease internal and external uh, parts of this discussion for China. And so you'll see ramp up in military drills from uh, the PLA. You're going to see intense rhetoric. But thus far, there's a belief that it won't be as intense as we saw um, in the uh, wake of Speaker Pelosi's trip, there's a thought that these trips do have an importance, but that they don't actually alter the calculus of how Taiwan is, is treated. And so as long as that isn't being uh, changed or challenged, I think that we can assume that the high watermark in China's action is going to be uh, what we saw uh, in, in response to Speaker Pelosi, probably a little bit less. Um, now, your broader question was, holy moly, how should we read some of these stark, scary comments from, um, from members of the military here in the U.S.? Um, I think that we should read them as, you know, enlightened insight from folks who are on the front line. And I would just note, they're not new, right? We've had similar comments from uh, General Davidson, for example, who said that he thought that we could see conflict before 2027. And that's what makes all of these little tiny battles in this ongoing, effectively Cold War important to watch, to make sure that it doesn't shift away from being a Cold War into a real war. Yeah, that, that memo was frightening. All right, so uh, very few things bring both parties together. TikTok seems to right now as the bans are spreading state by state throughout the country. Then in late March, the TikTok CEO will testify in Congress. Any chance TikTok is banned, can that CEO calm congressional fears about Chinese data gathering? If I've learned anything, there's always a chance. I just don't think that TikTok getting banned is probable yet. It is possible. I'm just not there on it being probable. I think that there are a number of political and procedural hurdles between here and there. First and foremost, I'll note that at least on the federal side, you only have one elected Democrat who signed on to any of the uh, TikTok ban bills that we've seen in Congress so far. I will look to see if someone like Senator Mark Warner from Virginia, who's one of the top Democrats on the key committee, if he changes his tone and suddenly he joins team ban, then maybe that legislation will move. On the CFIUS front, which has been reviewing this and has the, um, has the ball from an administrative standpoint, it's a bit of a black box. And ultimately all that we can hang our hat on is the fact that there have been talks between the company and the US government, and there have been some concrete steps to assuage some of those concerns. I just can't tell you if that's gonna be enough. So Isaac, then I guess, what do you think the likely outcome is when it does come to TikTok and its future here in the U.S.? Because like Dave said, we do have the TikTok CEO testifying in front of Congress in March. Serious concern just about the national security risks here. How do you see this then all playing out? 
Look, I, I think that um, what we continue to hear is that TikTok is pressing forward with the um, with uh, the attempt to assuage these concerns by something they call Project Texas, which is basically just onshoring the operations with Oracle. The question that I can't answer for you is, is that going to make folks like the FBI, the Treasury Department, DHS, you know, the alphabet soup that ultimately decides what CFIUS does happy? My base case is that they're able to come to some sort of an agreement that allows for um, CFIUS and other parts of the U.S. government to remain vigilant in their oversight of how data flows from us through the company and make sure that it doesn't actually go back to China. That's my base case. But, you know, at this point, I, I, we have to see how the next few weeks go. Let's see if there's another article talking about backdoor access to the data. And let's see if the CEO is ap able to actually come to Congress and make a compelling case that they've changed. All right. Got to leave it there. Isaac Boltanski, BTIG Director of Policy Research. Appreciate your time there, sir. Coming up, the Eagles and Chiefs going to the Super Bowl, but the NFL took a sack when it comes to streaming this season. Stay tuned for the details. Philadelphia Eagles, a two-point favorite over the Chiefs to win Super Bowl 57 out there in Arizona. Injuries, no doubt, hurt the ratings as the Eagles eviscerated the Niners down to their fourth string QB, but a massive number, well north of 30, probably 40 million, no doubt. Watch Patrick Mahomes escape to top Burrow, and the Bengals should get those numbers later tonight. Just the latest example of the NFL continuing to assert its will over the entire television landscape. However, the league took a big L in their streaming kickoff. Ratings for Amazon Thursday Night Football down an astounding 41% from 2021 from an average of 16.4 million to fewer than 10 million viewers. Ratings for ESPN, solid, just slightly down from last season, 13.4 million. Eagles Chiefs will be awesome. More than 110 million people, excuse me, will watch while the battle bean counters are considering 
is ratings versus revenue. And this one is a blowout, unlike the Super Bowl. Amazon and the NFL want more viewers on Thursday night, but cash is king here. The league still featured 88 of the top 100 most watched shows in 2022. And here's the score that matters most. $113 billion over 11 seasons. That's how much the league's media partners will fork over. YouTube Sunday NFL ticket deal said to be worth as much as 2.5 bill per year. The commish, he sees cord cutting accelerating more than 20 million since 2014, a number expected to grow to 80 million by 26. The most common age group to Adios Cable, 18 to 29 year olds. Amazon would point out their median age viewer this season is 47. That may sound old. It's seven years younger than the legacy networks. The ratings will improve as streaming picks up and the matchups will also improve. Al Michaels called them dreadful and equated them to selling used cars. They have to be better. But like the big banks, the NFL is too big to fail and they're too big to care about one ratings miss. Like recent earnings reports, guidance is all that matters here. And football is 100% recession proof. My point being, a lot of people are making a lot of the streaming number, uh, Shauna, and for good reason. It's Amazon, but they're not scared. They're not scared one bit. Growth is all there. The league will continue to explode when it comes to television ratings. And Amazon's numbers, I think, will grow over the years. NFL's big question was, would it look competent? Would the stream go down? Would the broadcasters be solid? It looked less just like NBC or CBS, except for the awful matchups. Well, it was just an amazing, amazing way that they did this season. Like you were saying, expectations were so low. I think initially there was a lot of fanfare about how maybe they would include certain things that would stick out just in terms of streaming versus traditional cable. Clearly, we didn't get that. But like you're saying, there was no huge mishaps in terms of Nothing. airing these games. That was a massive win for Amazon. Everything that's come out of Amazon saying how pleased they were, how excited they were with how smooth this season when big question I think going forward as we do see more and more games stream here over the next several years just how that of course then differs lots of questions about how Amazon might be able to incorporate more of its business its prime business into those broadcasts but yeah. clearly NFL is a massive winner here Super Bowl coming up like you said about 110 million people expected to watch no question no slowing down in the NFL right now I expect that shopping will inevitably become part of the NFL Amazon broadcast yeah. I don't think we're going to to see it for three, four, maybe even five years as they want to prove competency first. But keep an eye on this. Black Friday, yeah. NFL game, this coming season on NFL, on, on Amazon. I don't know how there won't be some type of they have to. shopping collaboration. It's unavoidable. Oh, it's unavoidable, and it's so, so smart here. What do you got? Amazon Eagles or going. Chiefs? Eagles! I'm from Philly. It's not even Chiefs. a question. You do? I got the Chiefs. We're going to talk about it. we got two, two weeks to convince you otherwise. All right, well, coming up, we are counting down to the closing bell on Wall Street. Losses across the board. Stick with us.
All right, just a couple of minutes away from the closing bell, so let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery to break down the market action. Hello, sir. Hello there. We well, looks like we got a little down action to start the week, but we're going to see if we got turnaround Tuesday tomorrow, unless something drastic happens in the next two minutes. NASDAQ down 2%, Dow down 8 tenths of a percent, so maybe uh, the NASDAQ leading down uh, is kind of uh, par, for course for this, uh, par for the course for this year. We've seen uh, staples in the green today, but just barely holding on energy, taking the biggest hit to the downside. That's, that sector is off more than 2%, followed by tech, consumer discretionary, and communication services. These these three sectors are the mega cap sectors. So let's take a look at the NASDAQ, not expecting great things. Tesla taking a little bit of a break from its 40 plus uh, ascent this year. Meta down 3%, Nvidia down almost 6%. Let's dive into these chip stocks. Also seeing some weakness in China. We'll get there in a second, but let's take these chip stocks first. We got AMD earnings after the bell tomorrow. We're going to bring those to you, so keep it open for that. Nvidia down 6%, I was saying. Micron down 3%, and we just got some news with with respect to Huawei. Now, chip stock has already been down earlier this morning. Chinese stocks had already earlier uh, had already been down earlier this morning, but it looks like the Commerce Department is not giving licenses for any U.S. tech companies to export technology to Huawei anymore. So this is an expansion of those Trump-era policies and uh, heading in a more adversarial direction. So we see Pinduoduo down 7%, 6% for BABA as we head into the final minutes here. Let me just close with the meme stocks. Um, I don't know that Carve Vanna is a meme stock, but it's sure attract a, a tracking like one. It's up 20% today, 28%, uh, while most of the other stalwarts like Game, uh, AMC and GameStop, those are down. And here we see Coinbase down 8%, GameStop down 6%, Hertz down 3%, AMC down 9%. Well, let's take a look at the leaders board, and I'm going to leave this with you as we go to our final, our first closing bell on Wall Street. That does it for today's trading day. All three of the major averages, like Jared just said, ending in the red. You're looking at the Dow off 260 points. S&P off just over 1%. The Nasdaq off nearly 2%. A massive, massive week here for the markets. A number of earnings reports set to hit the tape over the next four trading days. We had the Fed decision on Wednesday and also the jobs report on Friday. So certainly we could see big moves here in the broader markets. All right, let's take a look at some of the big movers of the day and take a look at Lucid because this stock has been on a wild ride over the past two trading days. Lucid closing off just over 8% today, still up about 30% when you factor in today's trading action and Friday's trading action. The two-day jump coming on the heels of news that Saudi Arabia's public investment fund will potentially want to buy out the rest of the EV makers shares here. Saudi Arabia's fund already owns about 60 percent of Lucid. A lot of excitement following that, that speculation, those reports, Dave, on Friday. Coming back down just a bit, giving up some of those uh, gains today. But I think the big question here going forward with Lucid is what this company is going to look like, given the broader macroeconomic landscape right now, given the competition from Tesla, given the fact that the price cuts placing even more pressure on a name like Lucid. You're, you're scratching your head here, really trying to figure out what this company looks like when, when you move forward. Yeah, I, I don't know how much they're impacted by those price cuts. This is a much more expe expensive end of the segment. You're talking about the cheapest Lucid car, $87,000, and most of them priced well north of 100 k So it's a very different consumer. But Morgan Stanley did say they are impacted by what they call the Hunger Games pricing war, which is uh, pretty descriptive. But that stock, just a wild ride Friday, 43% uh, climbing, was halted 12 times. I think they really do need that Saudi acquisition, although the Saudi fund did not comment and Lucid did not comment. It sounds as though that has not been squashed. It sounds like it is still a distinct possibility out there and something they desperately need because to your point, fundamentals of this company, uh, a record 3,500 cars produced in Q4, 3,500. They squandered whatever first mover advantage they had over Tesla. And it seems like, I know we're in the early innings of the EV game, but when you don't take advantage of that first mover uh, advantage, it seems like it can get re dark really early. Yeah, exactly. And especially right now, just given that broader economic landscape, a shrinking consumer wallet, clearly an issue here 
for Lucid, for Rivian, some of those cars that are so expensive. Like you said, Wall Street seems to be a little bit mixed. We had a number of price targets cut in the week or so leading up to this report on Friday. Morgan Stanley lowered its price target to 5 bucks a share. CFRA lowered their price target to 12 bucks a share. So we'll see whether or not this deal, in fact, does go through. All right, shares of SoFi soaring after reporting better than expected earnings and providing an upbeat revenue forecast for 23. But its student loan business is taking a hit. Or, or, <laughs> originations, excuse me, it's a tough word for me today. We're down 72% in the quarter as a result of the student loan payment pause. We heard from the SoFi CEO, Anthony Noto, on Yahoo Finance earlier today. He explained how eliminating the moratorium on student loan payments could help with the debt ceiling. There's currently a debt ceiling issue that's coming. If they just eliminated the moratorium on student loan payments, they'd recoup 50, five, sorry, $5 billion of tax revenue on a monthly basis, which could help fund some, some of that debt with uh, better servicing. And so it's right now a political quagmire. And unfortunately, uh, we don't have leaders in Washington that are thinking about the taxpayer every day uh, and using these bl blanketed programs to subsidize people that don't need it. Political quagmire and leaders in Washington that don't consider the taxpayer. Yeah, he's got that spot on. Uh, but when it comes to the debt thing, I'm going to take this in the, in the direction of this fight. Janet Yellen seems genuinely concerned every time you hear her speak about the debt ceiling. Most don't take this seriously at all, including our own Rick Newman, who says this is just political theater. But based on what played out with that leadership fight with Kevin McCarthy, I think we have to take this threat seriously. It, we don't know we don't know who is driving the ship right now in Congress. We don't know who is driving the ship in Congress and I think the results here from SoFi might have taken a lot of on Wall Street by surprise just in terms of how resilient it seems like their business is even in this type of environment. When you dig down into these numbers, the jump that we saw in the stock today over 12%, is the biggest jump that we've seen in shares in just over two months. Losses seem to be narrowing here at SoFi, the third straight post-earnings gains that we've seen in the stock. Now, looking ahead, though, personal loan originations, obviously a huge focal point. They were up 50% in the recent quarter from a year ago, kind of offsetting some of the weakness that we saw in student loan originations, also home loan originations in this environment. But again, the one-year stock chart, though, look at that, still off about 40%, so certainly a challenging time here for SoFi. All right, we want to take a look at another trending ticker, and that's AMC trying to make a comeback. The company trying to bring its debt down to zero by converting its preferred equity ape units to common stock, which would bring the total outstanding AMC shares $524 million, $550 million. Joining us now, we want to bring in one of the analysts here following this story. It's B. Riley Securities Senior Analyst Eric Wold. Eric, it's great to see you here. So certainly a couple of uh, proposals here under consideration. Big question, what do you see this? If it does impact fast, it pass, what does it do to its business? Well, as the domestic box office industry continues to recover, the, the biggest focus of AMC and, and others in the space is to make sure they're there for the recovery. And, and AMC is sitting on a pretty healthy debt balance over $5 billion of debt uh, with some maturities in the coming years. So they need to do what they can to have access to capital to address that debt balance if necessary. And this is one of the, you know, I think the best ways for them to convert these, these eight preferred units over to common stock, get an authorization for additional issuance of AMC common stock if they need it, and then had that ability to issue more capital and uh, hopefully eliminate that debt balance. So break down the short term implications versus what this does for the long term. So the, the short term for the next two months or so about a month and a half until the, the vote is to make sure they, they have the, uh, the support of the, the shareholders and the, and the unit holders to get that vote through. Um, nothing much happens in between then. Uh, there's no debt maturities, no issues to worry about. Um, what needs to happen is get the one for 10 reverse split um, uh, uh, voted in favor of, and then also the small author increase in authorization of common shares. If that happens, then all of the apes convert into AMC, and that, that security, the ape security, is eliminated, delisted from the market. At that point, you're back to a more simplified cost structure, and they will have the ability to issue more AMC shares in the market, something they haven't been able to do for uh, quite some time. 
Eric, obviously, so lots of questions just about the fundamentals of this business, what exactly the roadmap looks like for AMC down the line. Does this at all change those uh, question marks, or how do you see that impacting that longer-term view? No, no change to that. The, the industry has been recovering. The, the biggest issue the industry has faced is a lack of content. Clearly, we've seen uh, consumers come back to the theaters when there's been quality films. You know, three of the top ten films of all time have been released in, into theaters since the pandemic. So there clearly is content attracting consumers. The problem is uh, last year there were 50 percent less films released in the theaters than there were in 2019. There's been a supply chain issue. There's been delays in production. A lot of this, this stuff impacted from the pandemic. As that continues to get corrected in the coming years and the box office recovers, we're projecting the box office to get back to 2019 kind of pre-pandemic revenues by 2025. Uh, if that happens, then the leaders such as AMC, Cinemark, IMAX, those out there will benefit from that recovery. And so AMC's biggest job right now, or the management, uh, is to make sure they're, they're in place and, and ready for that. Um, and they need to have a, a better capital structure and a cleaner balance sheet in, in, in the process. So just try to survive, stay afloat until it turns around. Is that the concept right now? And why are you so bullish about theaters coming back to pre-pandemic levels ever? Yeah, that, that is the focus. The first part, I mean, in surviving. So right now we're not projecting AMC to be free cash flow positive until 2024, the earliest, more likely 25. And so... They need to have some cushion um, to, to, to get, have that safety net to get them to that point. And while we're bullish on the, on the box office, you know, I think what we saw during the pandemic is a lot of studios experiment with different options, releasing films straight to the streaming platforms, releasing them simultaneously in theaters and streaming. And, and what worked the best was uh, releasing them straight to theaters. I think a lot of the experimentation at the beginning was those streaming companies, those studios trying to boost up the subscriber counts initially and drive some awareness drive some interest, get that subscriber count going. Now that they've done that and that's stalling a little bit, we're seeing a resurgence of interest back into the theaters and seeing that if you release a movie there, consumers will come and that's where you can make the biggest bang for your buck is releasing that into the theater. I'm picturing Leonardo DiCaprio and Rose floating out there in the ocean and only one of them is going to survive. <laughs> can they stay? Uh, just, just the way my mind works. <laughs> Eric Wold, good to see you. Thanks, Ben. Coming up, tech giants have laid off thousands of staffers over the last few weeks. After the break, we'll tell you why those layoffs are the problem of the industry's own making. Stay with us.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. The big tech hiring spree during the pandemic has come to an abrupt end. Now, a number of big tech companies, including Google, Microsoft, Salesforce, are cutting jobs. More than 68,000 have been cut from the industry just since the start of the year. Tech reporter Dan Halley joining us now with a closer look. And Dan, you're taking the position that this is a problem of big tech's own doing. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and as you said, the 68,000 jobs uh, lost in the industry since the start of this year, 240,000 jobs lost since the start of 2021. And if you look at how these companies staffed up and the kind of thinking that was behind that staffing, it really does seem like it is their own fault. Um, you know, they've talked a lot about how there's been different changes to uh, the uh, economy, um, micro uh, sorry, macroeconomic uh, conditions, you know, rising interest rates, uh, inflation, uh, everything uh, from the gamut uh, of excuses that you hear regularly from companies. But the difference here is these companies looked at the pandemic and seemed to think that that was the way life was going to be forever, uh, that we would continue to just remain perpetually online. We wouldn't go to brick and mortar stores. Uh, and so they staffed to that line of thinking. Uh, and now they have to kind of pull back as far as the number of people uh, that they have on staff, uh, we've had companies, uh, including Microsoft, uh, Alphabet, Meta, basically saying, look, we miscalculated on this. Uh, Amazon uh, as well, they staffed up in their um, data centers. Uh, they went ahead uh, and built out more, uh, sorry, uh, in their uh, fulfillment centers. They went ahead and built more fulfillment centers or tried to, now they're trying to lease some of that property out to third parties. So, you know, this is this has been a problem uh, that we've seen uh, across this industry. The only holdout, though, uh, appears to be Apple at this point, which, you know, didn't need to staff up as much or didn't staff up as aggressively. Uh, and so they're not dealing with any layoffs at this point, at least. Now, this might be difficult to measure because a lot of these layoffs, Dan, are, are very fresh. But do you get a sense of where these workers are going and are they getting hired in a short period of time? That is what no doubt Jay Powell is watching. Yeah, I think that's something that, you know, what, what's interesting is when we talk about the, the tech industry, you know, the, the thinking is it's all Silicon Valley, right? But the reality is that these jobs uh, can go into any sector. Every sector of the you know, economy needs people who understand tech. Uh, you don't necessarily have to work for Google or you know, Meta or Amazon to be part of the tech industry. So, you know, these are jobs that can be easily moved, um, relatively easily moved to other uh, areas. Uh, and so, you know, uh, as we've seen, the the layoffs to the uh, broader uh, uh, job market haven't been uh, exactly overwhelming. Uh, I think uh, one stat said that it's less than 1% uh, of the total uh, workforce. So, you know, there's still opportunities out there. There are still companies hiring, even the companies that are doing layoffs are still hiring uh, just in strategic positions that they think are most important. So, you know, um, one of the areas that uh, a, a guest we spoke to last week uh, had pointed to was cybersecurity. There's still, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of openings and and the need there is very real for employees. Yes, it's different uh, from, you know, working on cybersecurity to perhaps, you know, working on a, a web page. But, you know, the idea being that, look, it's the tech industry is hurting for sure in these areas as a result of this, uh, you know, fundamentally flawed thinking that these companies had, but there are other parts of it that are still thriving and doing well, and in fact, need to hire desperately. Big story. Dan Halley, thanks so much. Tech stocks holding on despite widespread layoffs in the sector. The Nasdaq coming off four weeks of gains on pace for its best January since 2001, Amazon up 17% this year. The tech giant set to report fourth quarter earnings on Thursday. And our next guest has a new study on, on how third-party sellers have transformed Amazon's retail business over the last two decades. Moira Weigel is an assistant professor of communication studies at Northeastern. She joins us now. Moira, nice to see you. In this study, you compare Amazon's small businesses to day traders. Why? Thanks so much for having me on. Um, so the language of day trading, like a lot of the language uh, in my study, came from the sellers themselves whom I interviewed. Uh, third party sellers sell most of what anyone buys through Amazon.com. It's about 60%. Uh, given that Amazon captures about 40% of all online sales, that's a huge percentage of everything sold online. Uh, and several of the folks I interviewed who do this work or have these businesses 
use this metaphor saying, you know, what I do is not me, Moira, but what they do is less like uh, running a corner store than day trading. And I think that metaphor captured a few things for them about the nature of their work. Uh, one is the way that they're often selling many, many different SKUs, sort of speculating on looking for opportunities within this global infrastructure. Uh, other aspects have to do with how much it's mediated by screens, uh, the quick pace of it, and perhaps also the promise of a way to sort of make money from home, make money for, while you sleep, which uh, did and did not play out as expected for different characters I spoke to. Moira, for those who maybe weren't as optimistic, they weren't as appreciative for what Amazon had done to their business, they took more of a critical tone. What did you hear from that side? I heard a lot. It's a really interesting question. And going into this research a couple of years ago, I thought that I would hear a lot about Amazon copying seller products, which I think is something we've heard a lot about in the public in general uh, during these past few years of growing interest in possible antitrust action against Amazon. I actually heard relatively little about that. I'd say I heard a lot more about phenomena uh, that I think of as belonging more to the category of platform problems. So failures of automated management of the platform, failures to prevent abuse by competitors, like say, uh, you know, buying fake ratings on your product or knocking off your product and so on. And then a huge piece of the Amazon story that I think has not really been told or emphasized is how profoundly uh, the entrance of China into Amazon's global marketplace has transformed the business for US sellers. Amazon opened its platform to Chinese merchants in 2015, 2016, uh, and that had profound consequences for small and medium-sized businesses using the platform in the US. Uh, nearly 50% of sales by volume uh, through the marketplace are directly from China to the United States with no other intermediary besides Amazon. Uh, so that was a big change that a number of the US sellers I spoke to spoke about. Uh, I did I also interview merchants in China who have their own perspective, uh, but those are a few highlights. What surprised you the most concerning your assumptions going into this? And, and as you go out, do you feel better or worse about shopping on Amazon? <laughs> Um, I will say I try not to shop on Amazon. I do shop on Amazon uh, sometimes. I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, uh, and time is tight. Um, I think, and this is one of the main themes of my report, uh, that the way the conversation has often been framed in public is Amazon critics saying Amazon is bad for small business. Amazon saying, what are you talking about? We give this great infrastructure to small businesses to connect with consumers they couldn't otherwise. My argument is that neither of these is the right frame. Amazon is transforming what it means to be a small business into something more unstable, much more vulnerable to Amazon's whims um, and, uh, and largely dependent on its data and its infrastructure. So I think uh, it's really a big question for society of how much power we want concentrated in this one firm. Uh, over small business, uh, if that makes sense, and trying to reframe the question from just good or bad to really think about this profound transformation and where the things we live with and buy come from. Yeah, certainly very, very important and valid points there. And really makes you second guess really your view of Amazon because I'm with you, Maura. I have young kids and I buy a lot <laughs> of my stuff on Amazon. I wish I didn't, but it's the, it's the convenience factor that gets me every time. But certainly they do have a massive, massive impact on small businesses across the country. Maura more Weigel, thanks so much. All right, well, coming up, the workplace has changed a lot since the start of the pandemic, and it has had a huge impact on commercial real estate. We'll take a look at what's ahead for all that office space. And ChatGPT can not only help students write reports, but it can also actually help you land your next job. We'll tell you how when we come back.
Will 2023 bring the dreaded return to office? We're already here. Data from Castle Systems who track bad swipes. So a 10 city average occupancy is at a post-pandemic high, albeit still below 50% well out of the pandemic. What's the impact of remote work on commercial real estate values? Kevin Fagan is the head of commercial real estate analysis at Moody's Analytics. Kevin, good to see you. How do you measure the impact of remote work on commercial real estate values? Well, that's a million dollar question right now. And I think um, there are a lot of us in the uh, forecasting and analytics side have been working on that for the last three years, actually. Um, and I think this is going to be a really exciting year because we're finally going to be really, this is the first year we'll be fully past uh, COVID and we'll be able to use this as a bellwether year to see what the return to office actually looks like. You know, we had Omicron last summer and the, or we had Omicron last year and then the summer. Now the fall, there was kind of a comeback, but now this is the real full comeback and we'll get to see exactly when these leases start expiring, these long-term leases for offices, of which there's a lot expiring in 2023. Uh, we'll get to see what's actually happening when tenants are making decisions about how much space per employee they wanna take versus what they did pre-COVID. Um, we've seen a little bit of that, but it's, at this stage right now, we're in such a transition period where co companies are trying to figure that out. We haven't gotten a lot of really solid clues yet. There's been just as many stories of, you know, tenants re-signing for as much space or more than they had uh, uh, before, like in the last three years. Mm -hmm. And we've also seen a lot of the stories where uh, tenants are pulling back. It really depends a, a lot on the individual companies, but we haven't seen a widespread shift away from it. But this year might offer some real clues for the first time. Yeah, it seems like most you talk to are reducing that footprint. Do you get a sense that returned office versus remote work is at least beginning to level out in 23? Yeah, I think that I think that castle number that you showed there of uh, uh, nearly about right, let's say right around 60 percent makes a lot of sense. You know, you're going to have a lot of hybrid working now uh, where you have people coming in maybe two days a week, three days a week. Maybe it'll average around three. That's kind of what we can see from a lot of surveys. So you kind of lop off the beginning and end of the week. Uh, that basically means your badge swipes the, ca the castle is uh, monitoring has is going to level out somewhere around 60 percent. And that makes sense. Now, the real key here is, is of that 40% uh, where you don't have people in the office, how can you, how efficiently can you turn that into less office space? And it's not really clear that you can be that efficient with that. Um, so that's the, that's the kind of magic number, your efficiency factor. So how have those buildings that, that are now much more competitive, those buildings, those landlords, how have they been forced to evolve in what they're offering potential tenants? Yeah, we started to see offices get to be managed more and more like hospitality, even pre-COVID. Uh, that was really kind of starting to ramp up. We actually saw a lot of partial remote working uh, somewhere around the order of 9 to 10% uh, on average across the nation. Uh, so obviously COVID changed that. But even, even before COVID, we started to see hospitality-like management of offices, especially in that high-end class A, high amenity space, uh, already start to happen. Hudson Yards is a great example. Uh, in New York. And really, I think uh, that's going to evolve in a really major way. I wouldn't say it's kind of like the iPhone revolutionizing cell phones back in 2007, exactly. But we are at a real precipice here where uh, the, the experience of the office is about to be very different. So dynamic social spaces, actually here at Moody's, uh, we just finished a, a floor that's very archetypical of what we're seeing now in a lot of renovations of office space where you have just an incredible amount of collaborative, different kinds of collaborative space, recharge areas. Mm -hmm. We have two libraries in that new space. We have uh, uh, like three different types of collaborative space. You have recharge space. So I think you're going to see a lot more of that, a lot more outdoor space. Right. Uh, so yeah, that's really the, the design changes are pretty dramatic. I released, recently played pickleball at a New York office building. <laughs> uh, moving forward, the concept of conversion from commercial slash office space to residential. Uh, where are we seeing that and how much do you think it'll pick up in 2023? Yeah, um, you have to have a pretty steep decline in values and rents for offices to be a viable viable candidates for uh, conversion into, into, into apartment. We had done a study on New York where we found that maybe uh, 3% were viable candidates uh, from both like a physical shape of the buildings, because some buildings cannot really be 
efficiently it converted into apartments, but also just economically, we hadn't seen a big enough decline in office space, or, or excuse me, office values and, and office rents for it to be profitable for builders to actually take the risk of that kind of uh, conversion. Very interesting trends to watch this year. Moody's Analytics Head of Commercial Analysis, Kevin Fagan, good to see you. Thank you. All right, you need some help selling your quaint, charming, or even stunning home. Turn to my new favorite assistant, ChatGPT. Residential and commercial agents telling CNN that AI has transformed their job in a very short period of time. Consider ChatGPT has been around a few months. They're using chat to write listings, social media posts, even drafting legal documents. For now, ChatGPT is free for users, but reports suggest OpenAI is considering a monthly charge of 42 bucks. One agent telling CNN he'd pay $100 to $200 a month to continue using that tool. Now that's an interesting question moving forward, much like Elon Musk is considering at Twitter. How do you monetize those people who will pay $200 to the same people that will pay $2 like I would? Um, how do you set a price that's somewhere in the middle? But very fascinating trend that agents, I spoke to half a dozen this morning, all of them said, Oh yeah, when I asked them if you're if they're using Wow, that's Chat fast GPT. adoption. When you think about the fact that we only started hearing about this I thought they'd all say no way, ago. I don't even know what it is. Exactly, or they'd be a little bit hesitant just in terms of how much they can rely on it, but it is very easy to use. I will say, after you enter a few things, or you try to do it a couple times, you do pick up on the keywords that you need to enter, what exactly the direction you need to give it, but this all goes back to the jobs that ChatGPT could potentially replace. Now, in real estate agents' side of it, they're not replacing their jobs, it's actually helping those jobs. But I think it gets to the point that some of those jobs that are replaced or maybe potentially could be replaced are those mundane tasks that a computer could simply do. There has been studies out there saying that it could potentially, AI in general, could potentially replace up to 70% of the work that gets done in front of the computer screen. Yeah. So that really just talks about how powerful this technology is. And I love it in this case because it's not replacing those jobs. It's helping them better do their jobs and saving time for elsewhere and what else that they could be doing just in terms of maximizing their listings. And that's what ChatGPT told me last week when I asked it if it's going to replace jobs. It said, no, essentially we're here to supplement the jobs and make you help you do them better. Not buying it entirely. Yeah. Uh, when you look at this, I, I know a number of agents who have an as, has a, assistants that do similar jobs to what these agents are telling me ChatGPT is doing. It is not going to take away an agent's job, but those descriptions will take away potentially thousands of real estate assistants. Those are the menial tasks that you don't want to do. And you have AI that's currently free. No question about it. It's going yeah. to take away thousands of jobs yeah. as we move But it's ahead. interesting, the uh, monetization aspect of it, too. You're saying that the agents would pay, what, up to $200 a month just to use this. It really shows how valuable this technology yeah, is. It can't be free much longer. Yeah. These reports are certainly reliable. I don't know if 40 bucks is a little high. I certainly would not pay that. Uh, I think somewhere around 5 bucks with the average mm -hmm. user. But when you've got people that will pay 50 bucks. That's the question for them, much like it is for Elon. <laughs> exactly right. Speaking, uh, sticking with ChatGPT, talking about how much of an impact it could really have across industries, let's talk about how it could help you find your next job. According to a working paper written by three MIT researchers, job seekers are tapping into AI. They're seeing an 8% increase in their chances of getting hired. Carrie Hannon joining us now with a closer look at this. And Carrie, the big question, how exactly is AI increasing those chances of getting hired? Yeah, you know, I absolutely love this study. I mean, this is one of those, uh, I think, a really happy story about AI helping job seekers, right? So what it can do is because writing skills are really super key in what employers are looking for because it shows that, you know, you have an attention to detail, you're a good communicator, and often simply allows them to understand what your skills are. It's how you present yourself, right? 
And we all have asked our, our, you know, our partners or, or our buddies or whoever to proofread our resumes. And trust me, there are always mistakes. There are misspellings. There's typos. There's all kinds of things. What this AI does is it lets people do their resume, uh, do a check through this, and they'll, pu- you know, pull out things like, you know, phrases that you use or correcting your spelling or your grammar. And these are, it just sort of levels the playing field. And so the study, the researchers found that, in fact, these people who, the resumes, they did a half a million uh, job seeker resumes they looked at and, and did two, uh, two uh, control groups on this. And they found that, that, yeah, it ticked up the number of people who were hired, who, you, who went through this system, and better yet, they got better pay. So, I mean, this is one time that I think it can be super useful and fast to help you uh, kind of smooth out your resume and put the best uh, polish on it. So Sean and I went through a little exercise. We asked ChatGPT to build our resumes. I frankly was astounded at how quick it picked up details from, I I don't know, around the internet somewhere. I didn't put in any years. It filled those in in terms of my experience. Although some weak sides, it added John Doe next to my name. It had John Doe's email address too, for those of you that want to email uh, John Doe. And XYZ University, I actually went to Colorado, not XYZ. Where are the real shortcomings so far? Oh man, I just love that, Dave. Thanks for doing that. <laughs> I, um, I'm using yeah, it. So, so, <laughs> I'm not so, looking for a job, but I mean, <laughs> I mean really I'm really sending a message every, here with this segment. <laughs> everyone ought to freshen up their resume. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, anyway, I think it just is promising that it can really, if bravo, if this can help people, you know, correct mistakes, you know, those spelling mistakes that reject you quickly. Yeah, yeah, this is great. Now, we all know the downsides to AI that's been going on for a while now. 90% of employers use the applicant tracking systems, which are like a huge black hole when you send your resume electronically. And most people have no idea why they've been ghosted. And it might be because they didn't have the exact word in their on the resume that matched the word in the job posting, or, you know, they had a gap in their resume. So it's, it's really been problematic for workers who, um, you know, really are, we call them the hidden workers. A a Harvard study looked into this and it's pretty uh, extensive and it's problematic, but that's something that that's the sort of the dark side of the AI and the job hunt and the resume uh, area. But I'm liking this stuff about fixing spellings because I've been guilty of finding these on my own, even when I read them out loud. You know? <laughs> it does certainly help. And David, I was going to say, you're lucky that you actually had John Doe. My chat GPT totally forgot to put my name anywhere on the resume. Did you tell it your name? <laughs> I told it my name. That was the oh, first thing I typed oh. in there, and it didn't include it at all. But it's got some of the other information, right? So it can be too critical. Strong analytical it skills. That's exactly what they got right. Stuck exactly. the landing. <laughs> well to go, go. chat. <laughs> all right, Gary, thanks so much for that. <laughs> thanks, guys. All right. All right, well, we are officially in the thick of earnings season. Whirlpool, one of the many companies reporting after the bell today. We've got that for you after the break.
time for some of our after hours trending tickers. Let's take a look at two names. We have Whirlpool and NXP. It's all about earnings this week. Kicking it off with Whirlpool, we're looking at gains here in extended trading up just about 2%. Some nuggets here from this earnings report guidance meeting the street's expectations. They see revenue of $19.4 billion for the year. EPS outlook in line with the street's estimates as well. A reason why we're seeing the stock pop here in extended trading, I think a lot of that has to do with one line here in this report that the company does expect $800 to $900 million benefit this year in part due to some easing raw material inflation costs here. That, of course, is expected to benefit the company going forward. Intraday basis ahead of these results the stock closed the trading day a lower here over the last three months. We're looking at gains of nearly 10% ahead of this earnings report. The company announced that its president and COO would be leaving the company. All right, let's take a look at NXP Semiconductors. Again, a mover here in extended trading. We're looking at losses of nearly 4%. Now the company here, revenue forecast missing the street's expectations. That's a huge driver in this extended hours trading activity right now. Q4 EPS did beat the street's expectation. Revenue coming in just in line, up about 9% on a year-over-year -year basis. But that weak guidance, that is what's dragging the stock lower after hours. Over the last three months, we're looking at gains of just about 18%. Over the last six months, a bit, a bit of a longer-term chart there. The stock has essentially been flat off just about 2%. Dave? Okay, Shauna, thank you. My stock to watch for tomorrow is Snap which releases its fourth quarter results after the bell tomorrow. Analysts are expecting the social media company to report adjusted earnings of 11 cents per share on revenue of 1.3 billion and just shy of 375 million daily active users. We should be getting an update on the company's cost-cutting measures as well. If you recall, Snap was one of the first big tech companies to announce it would be reducing headcount cutting about 20% of its staff back in August. Snap shares up more than 20% so far this year, still down more than 60% over the last year. Coming up, another huge weekend for Avatar, the way of water. After the break, we'll tell you how much it's raked in at the box office.
All eyes are on Apple this week as the $2 trillion company releases its first quarter earnings report. Investors and analysts will be looking to see just how much the recent COVID lockdowns in China's iPhone city have disrupted production. Layoffs across the tech sector have rocked an already jittery Wall Street, and while Apple has so far managed to avoid eliminating jobs this year, investors are bracing for a tough report. Wall Street isn't anticipating much to celebrate, as it expects Apple to post lower earnings and revenue than it did a year ago. Apple's stock price has outperformed much of its big tech competitors over the past year. As of January 27th, it's down about 8% in the past 12 months, while Microsoft's share price is down 17%, and Google parent Alphabet is down 23%. But despite Apple's performance relative to the broader tech sector, shareholders voted to cut CEO Tim Cook's pay by more than 40% to $49 million this year, a move quickly followed by Google CEO Sundar Pichai, who also announced a pay cut following his company's decision to lay off 12,000 of its employees. And to its credit, Apple has managed to avoid large-scale layoffs unlike its peers, partly because Apple's headcount grew at a slower pace than other tech giants over the course of the pandemic. According to the Wall Street Journal, Apple's workforce grew by 20% between September 2019 and September 2022. During that same period, Microsoft's headcount increased 53%, Meta's 94%, and Amazon's workforce more than doubled. And that rapid growth, experts say, is what's driving cutbacks across the industry. We're seeing it across tech. Uh, these companies were spending like 1980s rock stars at a pace that was unsustainable. But the iPhone maker isn't without its own issues. Throughout November and December of 2022, Apple faced significant headwinds from COVID lockdowns and worker protests at manufacturer Foxconn's facility in Zhengzhou, China. The plant, which employs 200,000 workers, produces the bulk of Apple's iPhone 14 Pro and iPhone 14 Pro Max handsets. The iPhone 14 Pro and Pro Max, which start at $999 and $1099, are two of Apple's most important devices. Their steeper prices help boost the average iPhone selling price, driving higher revenue and margins for the tech giant. According to IDC's worldwide quarterly mobile phone tracker, shipments of Apple's iPhone fell 14.9% in the fourth quarter of 2022, down from 85 million units in Q4 2021 to 72.3 million units. But it's not just the iPhone that's faced trouble. During Apple's Q4 earnings call, Apple's CFO Luca Maestri said that Apple expects nearly 10 percentage points of negative year-over-year -year impact from the strong dollar. What's more, Maestri said he expects Mac revenue to decline substantially year-over-year -year and expects services revenue to grow but face those currency challenges as well. And while many investors sense trouble for Apple and others in the tech sector, some analysts are seeing signs of optimism in the months ahead. All right. Thanks, Holly. Certainly, Dave, some analysts, a number of analysts finding a reason to be optimistic when it comes to Apple right now. Credit Suisse, Jeffries, Wells Fargo, Morgan Stanley, all among those names that have an outperformed rating on Apple right now. I think a big question is going to be one demand just in terms of how strong or how weak that demand was during the quarter. What signal that sends not only to Apple specifically, but really to the broader market in terms of the state of our economy right now. And then when we talk about layoffs, something we've heard from so many of its competitors so far this year at the end of 2022, Tim Cook says anything in terms of headcount. That, of course, yeah. will be a focus for the street. The, the ground has certainly been softened mm -hmm. for Tim Cook to do that. It just doesn't feel like that's in the often. Unless we do hear, to your prior point, really weakening demand and really hurt by those China lockdowns. But now with China reopening, I think it would be a real surprise. Keep the focus on what Dan said there about Amazon, who more than doubled their headcount in the pandemic. And they've made some cuts, but you got to imagine more are to come from them. I'm still holding off on Apple. All right, Showtime will be officially integrated into Paramount Plus. Ali Canal here with those details. Ali, what are we learning? Yeah, this is breaking news. Showtime set to merge with Paramount Plus, and this comes as Paramount Global is really looking to have greater integration between linear television and streaming, especially as a looming recession is on the horizon. A lot of media execs concerned about that, in addition to a very crowded streaming landscape. And according to an internal memo obtained by Yahoo Finance, Paramount CEO Bob Backish wrote to staff members 
Quote, this new combined offering demonstrates how we can leverage our entire collection of content to drive deeper connections with consumers and greater value for our distribution partners. So there seems to be an emphasis here on rebuilding the Showtime brand, utilizing those resources to really drive uh, content, to really create some franchise type of content. So that's going to be a big focus and they're diverting investments away from areas that are underperforming as well. So we could see some changes to to potential shows, but overall this enhanced product, the name change, which is going to be known as uh, Paramount, Showtime with Paramount, that's going to launch later this year. Mm. And it's going to only involve the premium tier of Paramount Plus and the Showtime linear network in the US. So look out for that later this year, but yet another move in this streaming wars. And, and the media stocks continue to perform this year. I mean, Paramount surprisingly is up 32%. Warner Brothers Discovery's had a terrific start to the year. It's been a very surprising turn of about for the sector. It certainly Sean. has. We'll see whether or not that momentum sticks here. And Ali, we want to shift gears just a bit. We've been talking a lot about Avatar The Way of Water over the last several weeks, hanging on to the top of the box office for another weekend. Seven weekends in a row, this film was number one, just continuing to rack up those box office dollars, crossing the $2 billion mark globally. And this pushes the film into the top five highest grossing films of all time. In that number one spot, you have the OG Avatar, which which secured $2.92 billion. That's followed by Avengers Endgame, Titanic, then the Way of Water in that number four spot, beating out Star Wars The Force Awakens. So this has just been a phenomenal run for this movie. And the box office in general has been pretty slow so far, with the exception of Megan's success. Uh, we haven't really had a lot of new films in 2023 drum up that buzz. So if you're the box office, you're definitely happy that The Way of Water is continuing to add to those gains in 2023 because so far we don't have a heck of a lot of programming no. coming down the pipeline. It's remarkable with James Cameron. Seven straight weeks, number one, longest run since the first Avatar. It's crazy. And the third longest run is Titanic. I mean, he's got the three longest runs in the history of the box office. Don't ever doubt that man again. Don't doubt him and one heck of a talented individual. He's a genius. That is He's doing sure. just fine. Yeah. yeah. And I, his fun. timing of when to release a film might be it's, as brilliant yeah. as his filmmaking. And that, that too, right? Like yeah. the next big movie is not until President's Day weekend with the right. Ant-Man sequel. He so knows when you, to put it. You have yeah. an extra like month it'll and be, a half. Yeah. It'll be at the top of the box office likely to be maybe for a dummy. couple more exactly. weeks. All right, Ali Canal, thank you. Well, coming up next, we take a look at the states Americans moved to and the ones that they've left over the last year. Stick with us.
The trend that started in 2020 of people moving out of densely populated states with big cities to smaller, more rural areas, that continued last year in 2022. Now, the states that had the most people moving in were Florida, Texas, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Tennessee. On the flip side, states that experienced an exodus, California, New York, Illinois, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. This obviously isn't really a huge surprise given the conversations that we have been having within the real estate community with builders, with agents, with economists there, Dave. But of course, when you take a look at the list of those cities too, affordability, clearly the driving issue here. A lot of those states that people are moving to, those cities are more affordable. There's been a number of lists that have come out saying that in this environment, in this current landscape right now with mortgage rates creeping higher, with the fact that housing prices have jumped so significantly since the start of the pandemic, we certainly have seen a shift with where people want to live. And will this trend continue? I believe it will continue for years to come, in particular that migration down to the southeast where more jobs, more affordable homes, better way of life. And I also look at where those people are moving from. And as you pointed out, California, New York, Illinois jump out. Why? Well, you talk to people down in Florida, they are loving the influx of hedge funders. They say Ken Griffin himself has changed the real estate values down there in that area near South Beach. California, they're enacting or trying to pass new tax laws that will actually claw back money from billionaires that left the state of California a year, two, or even three years later. And then I get to New York, and New York is the real capital here because the numbers of New Yorkers earning between 150K and 750K fell by 6% in the pandemic, and those making 750 grand or more fell by 10% in the pandemic. What does that do to your tax bracket? It crushes it. Who left New York? Largely speaking, the wealthy, the people that had the money to go to the suburbs left, and that's had a dramatic impact on New York City. And I don't know how you replace those high earners. That's a yeah, big you problem don't. for It's New York a City. massive problem. We've heard about it a number of times when it comes to New York specifically, but also just the number of companies you mentioned that are out there moving uh, to Florida. We know a number of larger corporations have moved to Texas, which of course has had a huge influx in the number of workers there. So people seriously taking a step back, companies taking a step back, reevaluating where their headquarters are and making the most important decision for not only their business, but also for their employees as well. Transforming the real estate map as well. That'll do it for us today. On Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. See you tomorrow.